Good evening, everyone. Welcome to LSE Ideas and, and another webinar discussing important topics of the day. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have Professor Jonathan Holslag and Dr. Leslie Dinjamuri speak uh, and join us for a discussion of, of a book that, that Jonathan has, has written, written recently. Um, this particular uh, theme uh, uh, is addressed towards, is the West compliant in the resurgence of authoritarianism? A very topical and, and uh, I would say controversial uh, position on this question. As you know, the last decade has seen a global resurgence in, in authoritarianism. Democracy is in retreat and civil society is increasingly under attack. Um, what, what had been proclaimed to be the end of history the end, at the end of the Cold War seems to be receding and in, to the distance and, and the concurrent rise of China, a resurgent uh, uh, Putin's uh, Russia under Putin um, as well, have created a context where China and the United States are, are really in, in, enmeshed in a, a rivalry, a rivalry of what, what has been called strategic competition or competitors, systemic competitors as well from another perspective. Um, Beijing is being called out on issues such as human rights abuses, its, its role in Hong Kong, um, the, the South China Sea encounters. In short, China has been identified by the United States and the US-led uh, global liberal order as a systemic rival. How did we end up in this place? It was not that long ago where they were seen to be, China, the United States, and the global liberal order were seen to be working, if, if imperfectly, nonetheless, at least in, in lock, and uh, if not step. Um, so how did we get there? Jonathan uh, Holslag, uh, will we'll guide us in, in some of his thinking on that. Leslie and myself will uh, speak to that, speak to some of these issues, and uh, um, we will open up the discussions more generally to the audience. Let me introduce the speakers first. Jonathan is a, Hauslag is a professor of international politics at the Free University in Brussels, where he teaches diplomatic history and international politics. He guest lectures at various civilian and military academies across the world and has advised European institutions, NATO, and national governments on international security. He's the author of several acclaimed books, including A Political History of the World, The Silk Road Trap, and China's Coming War with Asia. All of these have been translated into numerous languages. He's a frequent contributor to global media, CNN, BBC, uh, CCTV, Al Jazeera. And, and writes as well for, for um, uh, the news media, the uh, Le Monde, uh, F Financial Times, and, and The Guardian. Dr. Leslie Vidamuri is the director of the U.S. and U uh, America's program and dean of the Queen Elizabeth House Academy for Leadership uh, in International Affairs at Chatham House. Uh, she's a frequent commentator on uh, U.S. Uh, foreign relations and is a reader in, in, at the inter in international relations at SOAS University and, and is in, indeed an advisor on the board here at LSE Ideas. So I'm the director, as I said, of LSE Ideas. Let, let me uh, um, uh, say no more about uh, the people and let's talk about the ideas that we're in, in fact here to discuss. Um, Jonathan, if I could turn to you first, um, could, you, could you tell us why you thought this book uh, was necessary, and this theme was necessary to draw on at this particular time. What inspired you? Thank you, Chris, for that question, and uh, thanks to the LSE, of course, for um, for hosting. Um, well, the um, reason for me to write that book was a very practical one. Um, like you, I'm uh, lecturing at the university and I'm lecturing this course with a rather broad title, Contemporary Issues of International Relations, which essentially challenges me to give sense to the recent history of world politics uh, since, the, uh, since the end of, uh, of the Cold War. And then, of course, if you start lecturing such a course, uh, you scratch your head and you ask, what should I do with that? Um, and then obviously um, a very recurrent um, theme and evolution throughout these 30 years um, was the growing pushback against uh, the Western-led um, uh, so-called liberal uh, order with um, the rise of authoritarianism um, uh, around the Western world, but also of course the return of, uh, of nationalism 
protectionism and xenophobia um, increasingly um, in sight. That, of course, coinciding with a marked power shift, you can say, uh, from the Euro-Atlantic Basin towards um, the, uh, the Asia-Pacific. Um, so that I decided to uh, embrace as, um, as the light motif, as the, 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 the red line through, uh, through, that, uh, through that course. Besides that, I have been puzzled uh, throughout my uh, still juvenile career um, by the degree to which um, the West has um, been very familiar with the intentions and the ambitions and the concerns of authoritarian powers such as China. Um, I have read um, throughout the last 20 years or so numerous reports, um, public and, and confidential ones in which uh, it was made very clear um, that China, for instance, was not willing to adjust to our normative uh, agenda on human rights, on, on the political system, um, but also for the same token on its economic policy. It uh, did make it very, very clear from the beginning that it did not want to backtrack on um, the objective and the desire to preserve the commanding height, so to say, over the economy to continue to support uh, strategic uh, uh, industries and so forth. So we knew all that right from the start. And, and, and when I, when I uh, dug into the uh, archives, we essentially knew that uh, China was not intended to change and adjust already from the, from the 80s, uh, the early encounters with uh, the Chinese leadership back then, still Dong Xiaoping, uh, by, for instance, uh, for instance Margaret uh, Thatcher were very, very, very clear. Um, and the Chinese essentially said to her, um, you have your policy, we have ours, and uh, we, we better learn to live with that. And then we had the Tiananmen uprising in 89. Same story. Um, the West uh, was very, very quick in trying to mend fences, restore relations, but uh, China, and then it was under Jiang Zemin, um, also made it very, very clear and transparent that um, it would be open for business, uh, but not um, that much for political uh, engagement. And it continued throughout the years. And, and the more the partnership with uh, China broadened and deepened, the more we had all these dialogues on, on a raft of issues, the more it became crystal, cre uh, crystal clear um, that we were facing a rising power um, that contrarily to the expectation of, um, of normative engagement, as it was called, uh, we just stick to its uh, its line. We faced some moments of reflection in the um, early 90s, you can say after Tiananmen, uh, also at the point that um, the Western world, especially the United States, were hesitant about what to do on the trade level. And back then in the early 90s, there was the discussion about the so-called uh, most favorite nation treatment, uh, which would give uh, China very, very generous um, um, trade uh, facilities. Um, and you had back then in the United States inside the White House, but also in Congress, this um, quite vivid discussion about whether, whether, whether they should really do that, because there was Tiananmen, there were new uh, incidents with, um, with dissidents and, 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 and um, new incidents of crackdown. But then still, in spite of the evidence going against uh, China's desire to, uh, to adjust, the Clinton administration decided to push this uh, MFN treaty um, um, uh, through. Same around the turn of the century when we had, um, of course, China's interest to join the WTO. Uh, then again, uh, in the European Union and the United States, all these questions about human rights and should we trust China um, that it would really genuinely open up the market, uh, liberalize economically and, and, and so forth. Still, we let it um, enter into the, WT, in, into the WTO. And then when it really became evident that this was not just an emerging market, but an emerging market with a potential for huge dominance regionally and globally, we saw that after the turn of the century, internally, the Pentagon, for instance, but also the European um, Commission became quite critical um, of the policy of constructive uh, engagement and also skeptical about China's desire and readiness to, um, to change and, and, and adjust. 
Yet even still, uh, despite these misgivings, uh, partially, for instance, I would say accelerated by the financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis, we still decided to go for pragmatism, if not, uh, if not optimism. So along the way, you can say that um, in the constructive engagements, the engagement was preserved, essentially economic engagement with a little slim layer of uh, political engagement but that it essentially was about, um, about, about, about business. And then when we got this decoupling, so to say, between the normative slash political part and the business part, we got to a situation in which we economically empowered a country that uh, was firm uh, in, in preserving its authoritarian line. We did so with our technology transfer or investment, uh, giving access to our uh, market so that now today, we are facing um, a country in, uh, in the Pacific um, with, of course, uh, significant clout economically, politically, militarily, um, that now also as a result has, you can say, the influence not only to preserve internally its authoritarian system, um, but those also subtly, I would say, still for the time being, uh, propagated um, externally. So we essentially have made a competitor, an authoritarian competitor, very, very strong, especially, and I would uh, reiterate that, in spite of knowing very, very well what was happening. And then we can apply that to China, but for the same token, also the resurgent Russia uh, after re the return of Putin in, uh, or the arrival of Putin uh, around 2000, uh, some of the Gulf states um, and, and so forth. So what have we done? And, 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 and especially... Um, why didn't we change and reconsider um, when our diplomats and our intelligence uh, services uh, made it very manifest that a lot of the policy was not uh, really, really functional? And that for me is the most salient part. Not the fact that China was so stubborn, but that we knew uh, that all this was happening and we knew that very, very well, it was very well documented, uh, but that we refused to adjust policy. Very, very well put and very challenging for us. The Western governments, the Western commercial interests, uh, completely compliant with this and, and knowingly so. Uh, I don't know, I've, I've got some questions, but I know Leslie has, has done work on US-China relations. Perhaps you want to comment. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say. There's so much in there. And I guess maybe a couple of places that I that I might begin. One is, uh, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, um, Jonathan, uh, one is that the, the big bet of liberal internationalism, that the liberal international order could be extended uh, by including new states um, in the, the institutions uh, that were so central during the Cold War that we, of course, extended and developed. Uh, in the 1990s, um, that that expansion of the international order, both institutionally both, and in terms of the instruments and in terms of at the hard edge, uh, the humanitarian intervention side and sub direct support of human rights uh, and civil liberties and uh, toppling in some cases dictators and, and in some cases trying to build new nations, that that big bet, and there are different parts of it, but that that big bet largely failed. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reading you to say this, and especially that it failed on the question of turning China into a responsible stakeholder. Bob Zellick's uh, great thesis that by integrating China into the international institutions and especially the WTO in 2001, that, that China would, would change. And, you know, I just went back before uh, this panel to take a look at uh, some of uh, Zelik's recent writings on this. He's, he's spoken at Chatham House about a year ago. Um, he's written about this. I, I would encourage all of the students online to read Robert Zelik's, not only his original speech when he outlines the responsible stakeholder thesis, but importantly, the more recent writings where he says that the that those like Professor Holslag who say that, they, that he was wrong and that it was wrong are misreading actually what's happened. Uh, clearly, um, China has become a very serious challenger to many of the ambitions of the World Trade Organization. Clearly, China is not playing by the rules of international trade as the US and many Europeans and others would like it to. But nonetheless, he, his argument, and I think it's one that needs to be considered, is that um, 
for quite a long time, China played by far more rules and engaged in the international system far more than it would have otherwise done had it not been extended a hand by the so-called international community. He, and he points to things like uh, China's support of UN peacekeepers, China's support of many UN Security Council resolutions, um, and a number of other uh, uh, interesting um, types of engagement that are you know, very concrete, So, which is why I think it's important to look to. Now, I'm not saying that I subscribe to the overall point. Um, I tend to be more on the side of, you know, we should have taken deterrence. And I think there was a deterrence line, even in all of this liberal internationalism that, that was uh, driving a lot of the thinking. Um, but it's very easy to look back and to say, gosh, the liberal international bet failed. And let's remember that it didn't fail everywhere and it didn't fail immediately. So the first big bet was, do you expand NATO to include some of the uh, formerly uh, members of the Warsaw Pact? It's hard, you know, that was a robust conversation, obviously, in Washington. There are many distinguished professors at the LSE who have debated this, not least with respect to its, uh, its implications for Russia. Um, but, the, but the bet was not only that that would um, do more for the international system, it was also that it would do more to secure democracy at home in those countries, right? The in institutions were not only there for foreign policy, they were there to secure transitions. And this goes to John Eikenberry's uh, thesis, which is that the, the international liberal order was, was devised to protect democracy and civil society, especially in the early post-war years. And I, so I think it's reasonable, actually, that in 1990, when the US looks triumphant, when the West looks triumphant, when there are plenty of reasons for optimism, that a very powerful line of thinking had a lot of empirical weight behind it and said, actually, let's give this a run for its money. They didn't listen to the realists at the LSE or you know, in, in, in Washington. There weren't as many realists in Washington, but there were plenty in the United States. Um, but I don't think you could throw the whole thing out, right? And so, and and, and I guess the, the, the second thing I would say is, you know, it, it it's then a question of which measures worked and which which didn't. And one question is, you know, including China in, in some of the institutional frameworks, certainly the WTO and engaging more generally, as opposed to perhaps a harder form of deterrence earlier on. Um, a second question is, you know, did the U.S., fail, and I would argue at the moment it's, it's, it's being too soft on institutions in Asia. So you can use institutions not only to include, you can use institutions to create new norms, create liberal spaces in order to shape the politics and the economic exchange in a region. And uh, that's what I believe the U.S. should be doing in Asia right now. It should get into CPTPP. It shouldn't leave that space open. For, for China and others to create those rules and norms and standards and decision-making procedures. So I think institutions are tremendously valuable for claiming that liberal space. It's just a question of what you do with them, how you use them, how you penalize those who don't play by the rules. But again, I wouldn't throw it all out. And I think it was a decent bet to think that you can use, that you can use institutions to alter incentives and to change behavior, which isn't to say that we got it right every time uh, our, our leaders are clearly didn't. Um, and, and maybe, you know, there's so much to say, but maybe I'll just say two more things uh, very uh, quickly. One is, you know, support of civil society was something that was clearly part of um, the Helsinki process throughout the Cold War. It didn't, you know, I, I don't think that very many people would argue that that in and of itself brought the, the wall down, changed, transformed the international system. But I do think that people think it was really important and that it was important uh, for multiple reasons. And those lessons, I think, have you know, become a foundational lesson that drove a lot of the ongoing investment in civil society um, in the post-Cold War period and since. And the question then is, you know, why did we step into that game and add military force and military intervention uh, in, in the case of some weak states? Um, and uh, in some very contentious areas to do things that we were never capable of doing and, and poorly equipped to doing, and probably led to a really serious backlash in, in multiple cases that arguably uh, did more, has done more harm than good. And we know, we know some of the cases and some of them are live and some of them aren't. Um, but there are all sorts of debates. And again, I don't, I, I'd be reluctant to say um, the West has always failed and always been complicit 
uh, and the resurgence of authoritarianism. And I'd be really, really um, supportive of a framework that said, you know, where has it worked and where has it failed and why? And to, again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because we don't have very many instruments for, for influencing international relations. And, you know, if you just listen to Biden's speech at the UN General Assembly this afternoon, uh, we're told, and I think it's a good lesson, let's, let's stay away from the military force, except for our you know, deterrence or coercive diplomacy, and let's do development and diplomacy and humanitarianism um, and any other number of things. And then my final point is that, you know, the big, the big problem is, you know, the global economy has clearly not delivered. And that is clearly, and you pointed to this, and I think really well throughout your book, um, you know, the, that I think is one of the big failures. We lost a very uh, serious and luminary scholar who's taught us so many lessons on this just in the last few days. Uh, we lost John Ruggie, and there's nobody who better equipped to tell us about embedded liberalism um, and, you know, the, the transformation of the global economy and its impact on democracy at home, not only across the globe, but, but, but certainly in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and across much of Europe, we know the consequences of that for liberalism, for liberal democracy. Um, and I think that's what, you know, that's one of the, the, one of the areas for redress now, but it's, you know, but, but was it, again, don't throw it out. Capitalism has done many good things, um, but how do, you, how do you refine it and, and channel it so, that it so that it bolsters rather than undermines liberal forces uh, in our society? Great. Uh, a defense of the liberal order and the choices there, Jonathan, over to you. Well, thank you, um, uh, Leslie, for a lot of these uh, insightful comments. And, 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 and I agree with you that in our assessment, um, we should indeed try to, uh, to stay um, balanced and, and sophisticated. Um, a couple of uh, spontaneous um, thoughts. Um, first of all, was it a matter of hindsight wisdom, uh, so to say? And wasn't it normal, um, given the um, optimism in the, uh, in the 90s to, um, to, take on, in, to take on China that way and, and perhaps be a bit more uh, focused on, on the success and the engagement part than, than, than all the difficulties? I think so. Uh, it's evident for um, rich and powerful uh, societies um, that they are a bit more forthcoming, uh, so to say, and more lenient um, in uh, in their external policy. I think that's that's evident when you when you grow stronger, and certainly when you get the preponderance that the United States uh, and the West, by extension, uh, enjoyed in in, in the nineties, um, you become a little bit more flexible and 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 forthcoming because, of course, also some of the um, asymmetries in the partnership at that stage are not or do not have to be considered as a security issue or something that existentially threatens for instance um, the social uh, project um, uh, at the center of, um, of world politics so uh, in a way i can understand yet i believe that the more you read into um, the diplomatic archives and i've also done some more specific papers on the china engagement um, the more also you reconstruct the debates that we had back then in, in Congress and in some of the uh, EU parliaments, that the reservations were quite um, substantial. Um, and that um, also the intel we had about, for instance, um, China's economic policy and, 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 and China's domestic policy uh, desires was, was very persuasive. Um, and it seems to me that um, often despite this burden of the proof, so to say, uh, on the side of uh, that, 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 that was more favorable on the side of the, of the skeptics, um, the politicians decided to by and large uh, ignore that, or at least they, uh, they didn't give it its, um, its uh, merited uh, attention, I would say. And that, of course, leads us to the question again, why? Um, to some degree, indeed, perhaps there was this um, innate expectation that China could be changed, but that too can be challenged because if you read in the biographies of, um, of George Bush, Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton, it becomes very clear that they too had doubts 
um, that Clinton, uh, for instance, uh, was on record saying, I hate this China policy because it's, um, it's so unbalanced, because there is such a lack of, of, of reciprocity. So was it kind of forward-leaning uh, engagement, um, uh, voluntarism in a way? I don't think we can um, we, we we can really corroborate um, um, uh, that we cannot really support um, this point entirely with uh, with the evidence that we have um, have have at have at at, at hands. So hindsight wisdom, I don't I don't I don't know. Um, China and institutionalism. It's true indeed that um, from the 90s the Chinese joined. A lot of institutions and became, for instance, much more engaged in uh, international governance than, for instance, a peer uh, such as uh, such as India. But then also always with a very clear agenda of selective engagement. If you look at the WTO, it clearly uh, benefited from um, the rules in, in 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 liberalizing trade in goods. But then, obviously, at the same time, uh, it resisted liberalization in other domains, trade and services, investment, uh, and so forth. So it selectively exploited, I would say, the WTO um, for the purpose not really of genuinely opening up, um, but continuing a kind of uh, export promotion that was very much government uh, supported. And that was premised on growing strong uh, national industry. So I think whenever the Chinese accepted cooperation in international organization, um, this kind of internationalism was just a means um, to get to the goal of um, comprehensive national power uh, and just the strength of, um, of the Chinese state and the communist uh, party. So is the glass full or half full? I just think oftentimes we misread um, um, the ambition and the intention behind China's internationalist uh, engagement. Uh, I think China was always um, uh, hard-nosed realism um, with a little facade of internationalism um, and then increasingly apt, I would say, at turning some of this international institutionalism uh, against the West. I think it really um, uh, exploited the WTO framework in a way that it became um, um, harmful uh, for Western economic interests. And in that regard, I understand a bit why uh, Donald Trump, in his own clumsy way, got fed up with it, um, as Obama, um, uh, by the way, also um, uh, was um, uh, before him. Um, so have we failed? Have we succeeded? I think when it comes to China, of course, we can take pride in the fact that China has done so much to combat poverty, uh, for instance, and that altogether it is still authoritarianism, but still with quite a lot of restraint. We haven't seen this kind of Maoist and uh, adventurism, this exporting of, 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 of revolution. Um, and in that regard, indeed, stability and internal stability helps um, build, um, at, at least in the short term, uh, a bit more um, international uh, stability, or at least uh, predictability. Um, but still, for me, um, the fact that now you have a power gaining uh, so much uh, influence and weight economically, in the long run, I think will prove quite de destabilizing. And for me, the problem is not so much China's growth as such, but the very fact that it's increasingly unbalanced. Um, and then we can, of course, talk about the recent Australia-US-UK partnership and a bit about the Quad. Um, but the fact re um, remains that um, this kind of power shift in China's uh, advantage uh, regionally and globally continues that um, uh, efforts or at least plans to reorient some of the economic engagements towards um, struggling democracies, and I would put uh, India up front, but you also have quite a few in, in Southeast Asia, is not really happening if you look at the, the, the data in terms of FDI, in terms of trade um, and, and, and so forth. So I, I am concerned that um, this rising authoritarian juggernaut, so to say, unchecked um, in the future will start to um, throw its weight around as most of the other uh, rising powers have done uh, have done in the past. And that leads me perhaps to a final point that is that 
One concern is, of course, um, the rise of an authoritarian power. The other concern, as you also um, um, uh, iterate, uh, Leslie, is that throughout the last uh, 30 years, we might have not done enough to fortify our democracy uh, inside out. With that, I mean that it was, of course, at some points all too evident uh, to relocate production and activities to China and not really to reinvent the market um, internally. And to reinventing, I mean, creating an economy in the Euro-Atlantic world in the West that, of course, would be more sustainable, uh, would embrace human dignity um, uh, more uh, prominently, uh, and would make sure that um, productivity gains would uh, would be sustained and, and also properly um, uh, redistributed among the people. And in that regard, indeed, I believe that there is a lot of merit in this concept of embedded liberalism. Um, I think uh, in the age of neoliberalism, we went way too far in just letting it go. And, and for the government also to say, let the market regulate themselves, um, but in a context in which, of course, a lot of our trade partners um, didn't have any desire to play it by the rules of the market. So how can we return to a kind of embedded liberalism that still gives, um, uh, I would say, scope to entrepreneurialism, um, to, 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 to creativity uh, in, in, in the traditional liberal way, uh, for the market to be free to some degree, uh, but then also to make sure that it is humane uh, and that it continues to um, to 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 mirror uh, the values that we hold um, hold close to us. Uh, does that exclude cooperation with China? No, but I I do believe that um, that might be a starting point uh, to make it more uh, more balanced. To come to the conclusion, um, yes, of course there are some positive um, achievements uh, indeed. Um, but there are also a lot of imbalances. And, and what really worries me is that certainly in Europe, we still have a lot of difficulties to get to grips with that. Um, and even in the United States, I would say that despite all the pressuring and the deterrence that is being built up, that if you look at the level of low politics of business exchanges of, of, of trade, um, still, Washington has a lot of difficulties to, um, to, 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 to rebalance that so that while we, on the one hand, try to push China back, at least the Americans, that on the other hand, we still try to make it very, uh, very rich through the imbalanced uh, trade. And I think COVID um, through AliExpress and Amazon and so forth might even um, have, um, have accelerated um, that and for the European Union, I'm even less <laughs> encouraged that we are going to come up with any policy that would testify of uh, of some some more uh, geopolitical maturity or um, how do they call it open strategic autonomy uh, uh, these days. Can I jump in and say so? <clears throat> if liberal institutions are not global liberal institutions are not seen to be fit for purpose here is that is that the reading that i hear from both of you that they are that they are served a purpose but in the context of great power competition as is manifesting particularly i'm thinking the wto was something that was constructed uh, after though it built on the past it was it was assumed it was built in a world where um uh, uh, United States preeminence was a given, and it, it uh, did not even have some of the checks and balances that that were uh, part and parcel of of the the first uh, institutions of the post World War II order. So I'm just wondering is 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 the diagnosis of how do we get out of this dilemma that that uh, is being posed here of authoritarianism on the rise and China's role that uh, are liberal institutions going to provide the, the solution or are they not capable as, as actors in this? Do we need to reconstruct the institutions in order to account for changed uh, uh, changing global environment, strategic environment as well? So it's a question really for both of you. Great question. I take a stab at that because I also have a, a couple of things I wanted to say in response to Jonathan's remarks. I mean, I, you know, the first thing I would say is I, I'm really um, hesitant 
to, to, to kind of make the ground sweeping uh, statement because as, well, first of all, it's really hard to build institutions. And, uh, you know, uh, Suzanne also wrote a great uh, chapter in our, in our recent publication, Anchoring the World, and she wrote about reviving the UN. And she said, you know, I mean, be careful what you wish for, get rid of it, and you're going to start building it back all over again. So we all know that UN reform is basically impossible, but building a new UN is probably even harder. Um, so uh, to that end, I would say, you know, some institutions work better than others. And it, I don't mean that in any kind of flippant way, but I, I think it, it requires very careful diagnosis. Um, and also we need multiple, we, you know, we have multiple instruments out, but we don't have that many instruments of statecraft. Um, institutions are a very important one. And I think the trick is to, to work out how to use them and how to adapt them. And, and, that, and that, as we know, is incredibly hard. But uh, having survived four years of a U.S. presidency uh, led by a president who really didn't believe in the collective, in the collaborative, uh, in the show of diplomacy, in the symbolism of turning up, I think that, um, in, in my estimation, that was um, that did us uh, very little good and, and a lot of harm. So I, I am not uh, a, an opponent of having liberal institutions. I just think we have to think very carefully about how to use them. Um, I also wanted to point out a couple things, though, again, and I guess I would go back to the 1990s. It's very easy. I think it's too easy to look back and say, gosh, we got it so wrong. And, you know, and it's important to remember a couple of facts. And so I wish I had one in my hands, but I don't. I was trying to look up what was China's GDP in 1990. OK, I don't know if either of you remember, but it was not very much relative to what it is today. And it was not not, not in the top 10 leading not countries, for 10. sure. If you are a U.S. decision maker and you've just, you know, you, you're telling yourself the story, we just end the cold, we've just won the Cold War, and you're looking out at, yes, a country that doesn't play by the rules and you want to kind of influence it and you feel like, you know, you, you're sort of riding a wave. Um, it's not unreasonable in the distribution of power such as it existed. And remember that people had at one stage been very worried about Japan and that didn't turn out to be the great worry um, that, that people thought it might be. Uh, so it wasn't an unreasonable bet to, to think that there were, that some of these mechanisms that were floating around and that had been heavily invested in for over seven decades and that had done quite a lot of good in Europe and in the transatlantic space um, might be a, an instrument worth trying. And, you know, just remember that China then isn't what China is now. And the second thing that's just radically different and a game changer that I don't think it would have been reasonable to expect anybody to anticipate, and that is you know, the, the technology that we now have, not least the internet, artificial intelligence, automation more generally, um, uh, quantum computing, uh, and so on and so forth. So all of these things have radically changed the game, but even in the short term, you know, just the social media revolution um, is not something that I think our leaders could have comprehended, and that matters clearly very specifically in the context of did they do enough to protect democracy at home? Um, I think uh, perhaps we can assign more blame on, you know, the, the sort of the enthusiasm for getting rid of or letting capital controls slip out of our, slip out of our sight um, and the Washington consensus. But then that layered on top of a fractured um, media environment that was made possible by technolog technological change that we simply couldn't have anticipated. That's a whole. That's a you know a game changing dynamic that I that I think that um, the hindsight is twenty twenty. But you know, looking forward, it was not in the nineteen nineties. Um, so, but to your question, I mean, I guess I sort of answered your question. Would I get rid of institutions? I absolutely wouldn't. Uh, it, no, and and I actually think it matters. You know, despite all the hypocrisy that we associate with the U.S. when it comes to whatever your views on are in Afghanistan of, you know, sometimes working with allies and sometimes not. If you're France, you're not very happy right now. Um, but I still think it matters that, that, that Joe Biden uh, uh, went to the UN and made the case for what he intends to do and how much money he intends to commit and what he hopes to get other people to do by making that very public speech and giving some sort of voice to people that are, that are on, the, on, on that side of the issues. So the institutions matter for all sorts of reasons, um, but I think we have to get pretty granular uh, before we start taking the axe and <laughs> getting rid of getting rid of any of them. Because God forbid you'd have to start over again.
Go Thank you. Uh, it's my turn, I guess. Eh? Um, well, perhaps a little bit more because it's 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 a very intriguing part of our discussion. Um, was it normal for us um, to have so or such uh, high hopes for China to change? And indeed, if we return to the nineties, China's GDP I think was ten times smaller than that of the United States still. Um, but if you again go to the archives and 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 especially if you read what um, some of the the declassified uh, memos and Intel um, uh, products um, stated at that time, it was it was it was very very clear huh? um, in the early sixty uh, early nineties, for instance, we had um, growing uh, tensions over, for instance, Taiwan, the Taiwan missiles trade crisis. There was growing trade friction already back then. We have um, literally intelligence uh, services warning as early as 1995 for the betrayal of constructivist uh, engagement, for the decoupling uh, between the political agenda and, and, and the trade uh, agenda. We have in 1996, an intelligence estimate of the CIA which states that China is going to lay uh, low for a while, um, but as soon as it grows more powerful, um, it will continue to do what it has on its uh, political agenda, but of course with much more uh, influence. And it continues to see the West uh, as the main obstacle, and I quote, uh, preventing Beijing from reassuming its historical place as the paramount uh, power of Asia. Now, of course, it's perhaps even legitimate uh, for China to seek to become the paramount power in uh, in Asia. But I would just stress again that there is a huge bo body of evidence uh, building up, especially as a lot of this stuff gets declassified, of the awareness that uh, was there in uh, different pockets of, uh, of the government about the very fact that this constructive engagement was just not working already as early as, um, as, 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 the, as the 90s. And then if you go through the memoirs um, of the people in charge back then, uh, secretaries of state, presidents, they will evolve uh, even in many ways that they did not feel entirely comfortable um, with the China, uh, the China partnership. Um, and perhaps, it's not just a matter of putting uh, blame on, on, on certain people, but just to conclude or to derive from this episode that just in international politics, it's not evident to change track. Um, that um, oftentimes we have this idea that through diplomacy we can make and shape, but that track dependency is something very, very um, difficult uh, to, to escape from. And then on liberal institutionalism, I would start answering that question um, by iterating that the main liberal institution is just still our democracy at home, right? Um, and I think we cannot entertain any hope or expectation whatsoever to preserve international liberal institutions if we do not um, do a good job in restoring democracy at home. Uh, and that's really the main battleground, if we can use that term, where we have to show to the rest of the world that democracy remains something very, very, uh, very precious. Um, how do we do that? Well, it comes with a lot of different um, uh, tenets of policy, education, I think, and investing more in civic education, for instance, is one of my um, uh, pet uh, topics. Um, but also creating this marketplace that rewards positive entrepreneurialism. And, and that comes, I think, with a more uh, solid trade policy, not the kind of Trumpian trade policy. But we do have to make sure that we, um, that, that, that we protect our um, companies vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, different forms of state capitalism that turn dictatorship and, 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 and pollution and these things into a competitive advantage. Because if we do not do that, um, we will continue to lose power. We will continue to lose jobs, uh, sorry, um, opportunities to create jobs and, and just pros prosperity and, and, and lose public support for this very system. Um, so I think we are in a tough fight for preserving democracy um, at home, um, really. 
Um, and it's, it, it, it's a kind of enlightened power politics. I think power still matters a great deal, economic power, political power, um, but enlightened in a way that we now cannot let the ideal slip because the more I talk to politicians and also especially people in, uh, in the business world, they say, they say, well, in the 21st century, we might just have to let the liberal agenda go. Uh, this is a luxury. We should go for 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 the the, the raw, naked um, uh, power uh, and 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 business. I think that would be very very dangerous because the West actually might lose itself in um, in in this turbulent power politics. And I think it will be very difficult to compete with the auto authoritarians if we do no longer know uh, what ties us um, to together. In terms of international liberalist institutions, I think they will only be useful and powerful if they are backed up um, by um, resilient Western states and, 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 and nations, evidently. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's important. And then I think also, well, when it comes to, for instance, the WTO, um, I really believe that we should make sure that um, we do not allow countries to engage in a kind of selective, um, predatory, and I would say even um, harmful way, um, as China did in the last uh, decades. Um, because I think essentially allowing countries in that do not fully subscribe to the agenda that's kind of self-defeating. Um, and perhaps we can understand a little bit why in the 1990s we were a bit more um, um, tolerant and, and pragmatic. Um, but today, like the WTO has lost its significance both for the Chinese, uh, in a, at least to some point, and also for the United States, because even after Trump, the Biden administration is still very reluctant uh, to significantly invest in its um, in its reconstruction, um, I would say, um, and then perhaps essentially use liberal institutionalism to reach out to countries that still have some uh, dedication to the liberal values. Um, I would say again that there are still a lot of struggling democracies around, uh, like I would say hovering between authoritarianism on the one hand, which becomes more interesting for them as China served as a role model. And then still, uh, especially in, in, in the broader um, layers of their population, uh, interest for democracy. What can we do through these liberal institutions to support them? And can we perhaps divert some of the trade and the investment back from the authoritarians to those? Like think of Tunisia, think of Lebanon. These are small, tiny countries in our orbit that I think merit our support. And if we could use liberal institutions to engender change in those places, I think we would be much more effective. What do we do with India, right? It's very easy now for us to say, yeah, well, with Narendra Modi, India is a lost case and it will slide into authoritarianism as well. I think it would be a catastrophic mistake if we do not use our um, institutions, our liberal institutions, WTO, IMF, World Bank, and so forth, to help avoid that India uh, backslides. Because from a realist viewpoint, it would prevent us of having a, a serious Asian counterweight against China. And from a normative um, perspective, I think it would be a devastating blow to uh, democracy if India would slip. Um, so yes, institution, liberal institutions uh, are important, but we might have to use them a bit more uh, sophisticatedly. I want to say one word. Can I say one word, Chris? One word, and then we have quite a number of questions. Oh, very quick, just very quick on India, and I guess this is a, this is a, a, a problem that sits there. Um, clearly, there's a lot of strategic thinking on how to engage India uh, with in respect to the China challenge and the quad is, is one form format, there are others. Uh, George, this goes back to George W. Bush and US-India strategic partnership. But the question is, how do you do that? You know, not only on liberal issues like technology, cooperation and vaccines and the positive agenda that we've seen coming out of the quad, but how do you do it to actually also address the internal issues? And that's, I think, where the hesitancy and where it's just much harder challenge because of 
the overarching strategic framework and concern that if you go down that road, then you lose India as a partner in solving the global public goods challenges and especially the China challenge. So I, I, I don't have an answer to that, but it's clearly one of the most pressing dilemmas that, that exists when it comes to deploying these institutions and working with you know, India, as you say, those vital partners. So, so we have actually uh, quite a number of questions. I'm going to not be able to get all to all of them, but I'm going to do my best. Um, uh, this is one that uh, uh, by uh, Philip uh, Lismont, um, and it speaks to a few of the issues we were just uh, addressing. He asks, how would we deal with the contradiction in defending the merits of Western liberalism by actively reducing liberal engagement? This seems to be an existential challenge. So he's asking the question is, um, that some of the assumptions which uh, are, are uh, part of the liberal international order uh, require change. That's that, as I understand it, he's, he's reading your thesis, Jonathan, and saying that we need to, that, that combating, uh, as he puts it, combating authoritarian regimes will require tempering assumptions of the liberal international order. Um, and that there'll be sort of nationalist state-led trade, it's decoupling is also a byproduct of that and the like. So or how do we deal with the contradictions that, and, and yet still be seen to be defending the order, the internet, the, 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 the fundamental values, which both of you have spoken to? And that's a very, uh, very exciting question from, uh, I believe one of my uh, very, very good students. Uh, I'm so happy to, uh, to see him participating here. Um, well, it's indeed very, it's going to be a very difficult balancing exercise because in, um, in, in the analysis that um, I, for instance, make, um, there is indeed a risk of entrenchment, um, a risk of also going a bit uh, all too far, the realist slash uh, nationalist uh, road. Now, let me make very clear that I'm not against international uh, engagement uh, um, in, no, uh, in no way, but I do believe that um, all engagement has to be conditional. Engagement for me is not an end in itself. Engagement uh, from the perspective of a society is uh, a means, very important one, um, to first of all, help preserve uh, um, the goals, objectives, ideals that you um, uh, embrace internally as a society, to work towards uh, stability, uh, stability around. And then also, and that's perhaps a bit my realist instinct, that um, in spite of trying to propagate uh, your influence, you also make sure that you gain uh, sufficiently um, in the long run, not on, only short-term gains uh, from, from cooperation. So how can we deal with that? Um, first things first, um, I think that um, for the West um, today, it's indispensable that we firm up who we are, right? I think it's uh, more important than ever before that we tell what we stand for. I think it's important for the sake of social cohesion. It's important um, also, I believe, uh, for our uh, position as an international actor, but we have to stand what uh, to explain better what values and ideas we stand for. And then I think you just have to pick your partnerships better, um, which means that um, if you um, engage the world, try to engage as much as, much as possible those countries that hold the potential um, and have an interest uh, to come to do things that go uh, at least to some point uh, to uh, your values and, and ideals. And we cannot change um, things overnight. Change is something very slow and especially as Leslie also said, democratization it took us like centuries we cannot expect that for other countries to 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 happen from the one day um uh, to the uh, to the other but the trajectory has to to be clear and the, the steps in a positive direction have to be there so let's shift a little bit this um tilt towards authoritarianism in a lot of i would say essentially european uh, partnerships increasingly so um, and, and, and try to see whether we can do things more with um, countries such as India, Japan, South Korea, um, some of the Southeast Asian countries, uh, for instance, uh, also very, very important. And especially, I would say, 
countries close to us because what what i really fear is that in our lose global engagement uh, we might completely lose um, influence also in our backyard uh, and that would be a very very strategic uh, mistake so let's resist isolationism let's resist um, protectionism um, but just choose and, and define our partnerships a little bit more selectively great um I, there's another question from Hugh McCarthy, and in fact, it's something I was going to ask you, so he, I'll say it in his words, though. Um, <clears throat> would a democratic China seeking to, re, wouldn't a, uh, we expect a democratic China to seek to remake the, the international order as the United States once did? In other words, is, is the issue authoritarianism here, and, and we're responding, but wouldn't we find the same pattern? if the liberal uh, uh, expectations of China had been realized by this time. And so just, just to your reading of that. You want me to take on it, but perhaps Le Leslie also has some, uh, some thoughts and then I can follow. That's it. Leslie, how do you feel? Shall we first cut? Sure, I wanna make sure I understood the question. So if China was actually a democracy, would it actually behave any differently? Or is it just a great power competition that's sort of a realist great power competition? The certainties of re realism would suggest that yeah. even a democratic um, China would behave this way. I mean, I, undoubtedly it wouldn't be simple. <laughs> Having a democratic, extraordinarily powerful, driven, ambitious, attract a China that was actually, um, less threatening and more attractive to its regional uh, partners and to people around the world. I don't, I mean, I think that would, you know, that would make the US and others feel insecure for any number of reasons, not least and especially competitive ones. But I don't think it would be the same. Um, and there would potentially be the, po the possibility and the prospect for a huge amount of benefit and gain if one had the confidence to trust that economic exchange and access to Chinese consumers and Chinese capital and Chinese investment would be um, regulated fairly or fairly enough by a set of rules that could be adjudicated when they were broken. I think that would be game changing. But that doesn't mean that it would be you know, easy and that wouldn't be extraordinarily competitive and that there wouldn't still be issues of miscalculation, misperception and, and all the rest of it to manage. There would be, but it would be different. But that's at least you know, how I think about that question. Uh, Jonathan, do you wanna weigh in on that? No, I, I, I largely agree uh, with, uh, with Leslie's uh, assessment. Um, to say that democracies don't fight is perhaps uh, <laughs> too much of an exaggeration, but I do indeed believe that um, there, is, there is slightly greater um, uh, restraint, um, but it, it, it remains a fact that um, powers, whatever um, form of government uh, they, they display, uh, grow more arrogant uh, when they, they gain clout. Uh, we have many city, states uh, and countries in the past that were republics, for instance, think of Rome and its clash with, uh, with Carthage, think of Athens, um, that also tended to be quite belligerent. Of course, they believed that they stood for justice uh, uh, and for the republican uh, uh, spirit. Um, but they, they also uh, became quite, uh, quite, quite belligerent. What, what I am worried about, uh, disregarding whether China is a democracy or not, is a China um, as a Eurasian juggernaut that remains unchecked. Uh, and I think what we have today with China uh, powering ahead and the rest of Asia, including Southeast Asia or ASEAN and South Asia, especially India not following, um, that worries me um, because you get such imbalances if this trend persists that it almost becomes inevitable that if it's not towards the United States, then at least towards its uh, neighbors, China will display the kind of hubris that at least we today um, uh, are being forced to come to grips with in, 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 in the West. Um, so yes, democracy um, modifies, but at the end of the day, if you have a 
power, a power or a country with the potential that China has. And such an asymmetric um, uh, growth and success, it becomes destabilizing. I mean, it's interesting, and I'll share the, this view, and I think that the South China Sea issue would not look necessarily that different in the sense of the aspirations of China in that area and the, the desire to have the United States, uh, if not retreat, at least certainly uh, reduce its positioning there. So that's amongst other things. Um, we have some other questions here. Let me, uh, this is one from Kathmandu. Uh, to Professor Jonathan, what sort of threats are observed by the West from China and why is the West so tough on matters of politics in China? Okay, well, uh, actually, I don't think that we, uh, we have been that tough uh, when it comes to Chinese domestic politics or the Hong Kong issue or the Uyghur issue. We have been vocal about it even if i even i believe that we could have been more vocal but we have raised the matter uh, a few times um but we haven't imposed any any sanctions uh, the only genuine sanction that is still in place is the arms embargo and even that with uh, uh, limitations because we still i think uh, trade for about 200 million annually in uh, in, in in defense goods with uh, with china um, that's the arms embargo after uh, imposed after the the tiananmen uh, uprising so i i would dispute a little bit that we have problems with um, or, um that 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 we are tough on china's domestic uh, domestic politics um, it's it's just not really uh, really the case, and and the Chinese also know that we are not going to be very very tough. I think an interesting um, case is going to be the um, uh, adventures of tiny little Lithuania with Taiwan recently. Of course, um, by China that's considered a domestic affairs uh, domestic affair. But are the other European countries going to stand by Lithuania, and in 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 in, in, in which way? Um, so yeah, my answer would be um, that we have not been tough, uh, and that in spite of a lot of things not going into the direction of the constructive engagement agenda, we have been very loath to uh, to change track ourselves. I mean, certainly many sinologists would say that that the absence of, of a, a tough and declarative approach here has weakened, has has in, reinforced the notion of a West as, as, as weak, and that it plays uh, into a general uh, belief in the malaise of the West and democracy and the like. If you can't defend your own values and interests, then what can you defend? So I think that that's contributed to that debate. I think it's absolutely true. Um, and, 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 and there are two, two sides, uh, two dimensions to it. First of all, I think we have betrayed on a lot of the reformists in China. And that's what they tell themselves. You have let us down. Whether it concerns economic liberals in China that feel abandoned um, uh, and have been uh, feeling abandoned throughout, especially uh, after the turn of the, of the, of the century, or whether it concerns dissidents or for the same token, some of the activists in, in, in Hong Kong, um, it is delegitimizing uh, the West as um, a partner of democracy. The same mistake, by the way, we, we made uh, during and after the, uh, the, the Arab Spring. So I think we, we really undermine uh, our credibility. Um, by the way, it's even um, more, um, important because like the EU is treaty bound to protect and advance human rights and democracy in its foreign policy. Amsterdam and, 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 and Maastricht treaty are very, very clear about that. So this kind of foreign policy we violates our own uh, constitutional treaties, our own political DNA, you can, um, you, you, you can say. Um, so that's 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 um, a first um, very um, very uh, important observation that I wanted to make, and then I think for the second I got lost in my argument, <laughs> <laughs> but it will come back. Well, well, while you're thinking of it, Leslie, did you want to to come in on any of those uh, issues? Um, I mean, I guess 
picking up on what Jonathan said about, you know, it, it, I, I do, I'm always perplexed by this, you know, because hypocrisy is rampant and in everybody's foreign policy and everybody's engagement. So to what, ex at what point does, you know, is there too much hypocrisy and you do actually erode any sense uh, um, those on the receiving end that you really are willing to stand up for your values. And as soon as you're a large power with multiple competing interests and limited resources, and you put forward a set of principles and values, then there's always gonna be hypocrisy because there are, in my view, um, always trade-offs to be made. Um, so I think it's you know, an inherent dilemma and many people believe that hypocrisy, uh, you know, still talking the talk, even when you sometimes selectively don't walk the walk, it still serves a useful function because it gives voice to you know, lots of people that believe in those values. But obviously that runs out. <laughs> You know, the question is when it runs out, and I think it's a really tough debate. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't have a I don't have a great answer. I think that um, what we're seeing right now is a, is a U.S. that's actually very driven to be strategic and pragmatic, and is realist in the execution of its principles um, and its and its and its strategic priorities, and that inevitably means that. You know, democracy isn't going to always get front and active support, democracy promotion. So it's it's going to be complicated for sure. And it's, there will be people who are disappointed. But I still think it's better to have it out there um, than to not have it out there at all. I, I wouldn't want to live in a world where nobody wanted to put their values out there unless they could be absolutely consistent in supporting them. That would be a, quite a bleak world because there would simply be no values articulated in international affairs. Yes, indeed. I've got Fernando Herrero <clears throat> saying, uh, suggesting that, that we should suspend the category of the West and, and talk about the U.S. Uh, as, as a starting point. Also, what are the options to, uh, for the liberal Leviathan? What are the options to the liberal Leviathan and a realist position of the U.S. first? So I, I wonder if, if uh, maybe that's a Leslie question first. Um, if I understand it correctly, it's first just pulling apart, pulling, you know, denying this this idea of the West and saying it's really America first at this stage and the U.S. as, as a leader. What, where does that where does that put us? I mean, I, you know, the, the West is a complicated concept. I sort of I, I'm, I, I'm filled with regret every time I use it because I'm not entirely sure. It means many different things to many different people. It means geography to some people or it has a geography basis that's largely, you know, in the U.S. and Europe. For others, it's a, it's a set of values and it, it exists across many societies, but it's not bounded by state, state um, borders. And so I think part of the problem in using the concept of the West is that we just don't all mean the same thing. And, and, but most often, what most people seem to mean is the United States and Europe. And, and if that's what we mean, then it's actually not a, a very useful concept. We could just say, you know, the transatlantic space. Um, but there is something that it captures in terms of a way, a set of aspirations that, you know, go back to the enlightenment and that, that project a set of values um, and commitments that I think isn't what the U.S. is, and it's different from the U.S., so I think differentiating between them is, is important. But is the U.S. just about America first? Well, I mean, yes and no, but, you know, yes, obviously there, the U.S. is, you know, doing a lot of things in a pretty hard-edged way, but it's, it's obviously not just about America first or why in the world would they put so much into um, the kinds of global public good commitments that, that Biden's right now talking about investing in uh, and making pledges to. And, you know, there's, there's still a lot that's, that goes beyond that, even if it, it looks pretty hard-edged, given how high our expectations have been uh, once Trump left office and there was a Democrat back in, back in town. Yeah, I don't know, Jonathan, if you, you want to follow up on as well. Right? Yeah, well, I, I, I agree that it's not going to be that um, black and white. Um, but I do believe that we have reached a watershed uh, when it comes to um, the history after the, um, the great revolutions of the 18th uh, century. Uh, this long trajectory from those uh, revolutions towards where we are today. Um, will we be able to preserve, consolidate, reinvent eventually? And how? Um, because you see that um, 
trust in and support for democracy is slowly, not dramatically, but slowly starting to retreat in the West as well. Um, I'm not saying that this is kind of the beginning of, uh, of, 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 of a, a doomsday scenario, but we should be very, very careful about uh, that. And okay, we have today a Biden administration that is more forthcoming and, 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 and likable, uh, at least from the viewpoint of the EU. But how about the undercurrent in the US and how about the undercurrent politically and socially in, in, in the EU? Um, and then again, I would advocate for enlightened power politics. I think we have to preserve in the first place um, the power um, to maintain the freedom of action, the sovereignty, the independence to make our um, democratic choices um, in, in the future. And, and what then does that mean? And, and there comes this balance between pragmatism and idealism in, in foreign policy. I think indeed that you cannot just project, completely project your ideals on, on the rest of the world. But I do believe that if you're in government, you have to communicate in a measured and balanced way about that. Not as we did in the last uh, few decades to really champion ourselves as the guardians of liberalism and, and human rights. The EU still does that, by the way. Just read into von der Leyen's uh, State of the Union last week. And then to come up with a policy that goes the other way around. I think then you should also explain, have to explain to your people and the rest of the world that we stand for certain ideals, but that we cannot achieve um, everything. So I believe a more measured um, and balanced tone in the foreign policy discourse is very important because otherwise you disillusion both your constituencies at home uh, and some of your partners um, abroad. Second, I believe that what we have to mind much more in international politics and also in, in light of this power shift that goes on is low politics. I think China and Russia and all the others, they do not so much advance their influence summit after summit, submarine after summit. No, they advance their in influence container after container that is being uh, exported to Europe or the West. Uh, oil barrel after oil, oil barrel, that's essentially generating the power shift. That is um, generating the changes in terms of trade, financial flows that are the basis, the fundaments on which they build uh, political and military power shifts. And what I sense, whether it concerns discussions with my American colleagues or here in, in, in Brussels or with member states, is that we now we're getting very uh, much focused on high politics and all the things that are strategic, military, um, sensitive stuff, but that we still do not have an answer for that low politics. And I think as long as we, we, we have these two kind of flows or currents disconnected from each other, I think um, a lot of your authoritarians will, uh, our competitors will, will win. It's of course not evident to get to grips with trade imbalances because it uh, implies certain corrections and adjustments um, that also consumers have to undergo. Uh, and that's not, not evident. But I, I really believe that when it comes to preserving power, um, that's where one of the main battles um, is, or at least one of the, the main challenges lies. I also would add that just coming back to the issue of the West and conceptualization, that if we, if we frame, if we use that language, I think, what, uh, I mean, the large, world's largest, if an imperfect one, largest democracy is not in what we, this geographic territory. Japan uh, has been a, a, a democratic uh, state and supporter. Uh, for, for well over 70 uh, years, uh, and uh, Korea, and so on, and so, South Korea. So we, we, I think we do a disservice to democracy by employing this term. Uh, yeah, so we, I, we do keep, need to keep that in mind. Mariah Thornton has a, a couple of questions. Uh, one of them here is, do you think the new defense pact AUKUS will be impactful in terms of containing or limiting the power of authoritarian countries in the Indo-Pacific region? And if so, what forms do you think that will take? Yeah, okay. Um, I think that pact is uh, it's largely uh, symbolical. Um, 
for the reason that um, UK actually doesn't have a uh, significant punch in the Indo-Pacific and that also Australia's role is limited. It's kind of more support for the um, United States posture there than, um, than, than it is substantial, okay, in the domain of Intel, for instance, it, it might be a bit more useful, but altogether, I think it's uh, its impact will be limited. I repeat what I said before. Uh, for me, really, the only way to rebalance China uh, or rebalance the landscape in Asia, let me put it that way, not necessarily to contain China, but to make sure that the balance of power is preserved, is to have a kind of quad-like uh, formation. Um, and then not only quad in the realm of defense and military affairs, but I think also quad in economic terms, um, which means that we have to work with India, uh, whatever the difficulties are, to help industrialize that country um, and make sure that essentially the rapidly growing uh, population uh, has more uh, employment opportunities. That's uh, essential. Then I think also a synergy with ASEAN is going to uh, be essential. There is a, a struggle for life, you can say, between ASEAN, the 10 Southeast Asian countries as, a, as an internal market on the one hand and China on the other hand. Like the last 20 years, China diverted a lot of trade and industrial activity away. We have to uh, help uh, ASEAN to um, to preserve its um, its 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 co cohesion. So I think that's that's really what we what 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 we need. Um, are we going to deliver? I I don't know. Uh, I do not see a lot in the pipeline of very very concrete substantial things that might change that. Of course, we have the. Um, American and European visions for uh, for connectivity now as a counterweight to the Belt and Road Initiative, but the budgets, uh, at least as I can see, what is committed are going to be quite um, quite limited. You are going to uh, we have different uh, trade uh, agreement and, and and trade constructions um, in the pipeline, but still that too will um, require the resolve to. Um, reduce dependency from from china and, and and not only in the sector of high tech but also the product production change more more broadly um so um australia uk us it's nice to have but it's it's certainly not enough Go ahead. hi chris i'll just add one thing on that which is i mean i think it i think it's true that that pact it will take quite a long time for it to come to fruition um, but I do think that it's significant because it, it will complicate uh, China's efforts to have influence and power uh, in the sea. It will complicate communications. It, and it sends a very strong signal as to, you know, Australia is, Australia's positioning. Um, and it's, you know, it reads as being a, a clear response to China's diplomacy, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy uh, surrounding COVID. Um, and it also demonstrates that the U.S. Is, is going to be highly pragmatic and highly strategic in, the, in terms of the kind of range of partnerships that it develops, um, even though it didn't initiate this, but it clearly is very much on board um, to, to deter China's influence in the region. So I actually think it's, it's a more significant development. I know that in Europe, the primary concern is, you know, whether people were consulted and, you know, that's, that's, that's a long, complicated story. Especially in Paris, indeed. <laughs> but I don't think it's the main story, um, as it were. I mean, isn't it also the main story is in the aftermath of the intense focus on what Afghanistan, we have to, we have to have, have us, you know, Indo-Pacific, <laughs> shift the lens, move, move and, and think about something uh, constructive as, a port, as opposed to the debacle of departure. You know, um, I, I've got a quest, a number of questions here, and so I'm going to just have to uh, uh, grab a few of them. One of them being from Gladys Mello. It was an observation uh, saying about China's contribution to international institutions. Uh, uh, she observed that it's more it's a it's more a way to change these institutions. She referenced DPKO, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and the reduction of focus of human rights teams and peacekeeping missions and and other 
other things like that. Do, do you uh, is that, do you want to comment on that or or come back on that? I'll I'll, I'll say one thing on that, which is that um, it's a really important point. Um, I, I I am in no way, shape, or form drawing a moral equivalence between the United States and China, uh, but I will say that the U.S. is also well known for um, maneuvering within and outside of institutions to uh, you know to use them in the way that it would like to use them or to deny them influence. So it's that is a common game, mm -hmm. um, and I guess the concern is you know do. Whose politics? The politics. The strategy might be similar, and whose whose kind of values and politics do we like better? So it's not surprising, but but it is a really important point. Yeah, powers act in this sort of way, and and uh, so China, so others as well. Um, uh, a last question: Tove Duncan Jones asks, uh, "How do you think global diplomacy and trade can move forward uh, when when Xi Jinping's China is slowly?" is resembling Mao's rather uh, rather than Deng Xiaoping's approach. I'm, I'm summarizing in terms of ideology and national reforms. Yeah, um, well, personally, um, I'm, 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 I'm not convinced that um, she is um, heralding uh, a path-breaking change in China's economic policy. If, uh, of course, the discourse is completely different compared to, uh, to Hu Jintao and his, uh, his generation. But the essence of Chinese policy has been dual circulation throughout. Uh, from Deng Xiaoping over Jiang Zemin, uh, Hu Jintao to Xi today. And dual circulation has always meant we engage in function of national power, right? That's, that's the bedrock uh, ambition um, that um, underpins everything. We trade, but with, we, we trade with the um, idea to make the home market stronger. We do joint ventures. We do joint ventures to get the technology from stronger companies. Um, so the, the, the um, language is tougher. It's much more ideological. But what surprises me more is the surprise in the corporate world. For instance, when we, when we consider... Um, the recent measures taken against some of the tech companies. Well, if you read what comes out of the State Council or the Ministry of Information and Information Te uh, Industry and Information Technology, for over 10 years, those documents have stated what was coming. So we do stimulate and support innovative Chinese companies, but, but uh, with a responsibility um, with regard to national security, uh, indigenous innovation, so Chinese technology for Chinese companies, and when it's not happening, there will be, will be changes. So that's the beauty of China. I think for all the suspicion, it tends to be extremely transparent of what it wants, right? But oftentimes we prefer not to see it. And that goes for the corporate world and that goes for the politicians. You cannot blame the Chinese for playing tricks with us, right? Um, I think much more of the responsibility is, um, is, 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 is on our side. Like when companies enter in joint ventures, well, it suffices to read what the government has in, on paper in terms of ambitions for that sector and you know what the expectation is. Of a joint venture um, and that again also coming to the conclusion of, of this uh, fascinating debate is also my main finding um, of the last 30 years we had our eyes wide shut um, oftentimes and in this high age of information um, with everything available uh, at, uh, at, 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 at hand um, we did do very little with it. And, and that's a very humbling conclusion, of course, for us as academics, <laughs> but I think also uh, for a lot of the decision makers, I would say we like to talk grand strategy, and uh, but oftentimes we just muddle through. Um, and perhaps that's inherent to international politics. That seems to be a, a good point um, to 
to draw this, to make some concluding remarks and, and to draw this to, to a conclusion. I mean, that was interesting as we seem to be just a, a few observations on my part. We're reliving, uh, if you like, uh, who lost China 2.0. There was a debate, of course, in the, in the 50s, <laughs> uh, and again, principally rooted in, in the United States and reflective of, of that. And we're now in, engaged uh, in another version of that, but on a global setting as opposed to the country uh, national setting. And, and in, in both cases, uh, there, there, were, uh, there was soul searching that went on that uh, amongst the institutions, the actors, decisions taken and not taken, uh, the, 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 the um, case of the screaming obvious not being ever <laughs> being recognized, at least as portrayed by critics. And, and uh, one wants one wonders uh, how one can repeat, you know, the second time it's farce, right? Uh, it's, uh, if, if, it's, uh, if, if one does this. Um, one wonders how, how analysts, as you just said, Jonathan, it, maybe it isn't that, that we drop the ball as analysts, but how analysts were not listened to in the, in the vast data streams, or we don't know how to project our voice out there. Uh, so I think that, that that may be some part of it. Um, uh, I also think that it's that uh, the question of cleaning one's own house uh, putting forward a democracy, uh, the, the, the power of, of, of electoral democracy as an, a, a point of attraction, a model, um, is under, may, may appeal abroad, but domestically when the inequalities that the very market-driven approach uh, has, has spawned, you know, eye-watering wealth <laughs> and people who feel increasingly that their generation is, is uh, losing out from their, their uh, previous uh, generations, that this also is a problem. And, and uh, you know, house cleaning will, will, of course, be important to, to getting institutions and the appeal of democracy back on the front burner. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for presenting and contributing to this fascinating discussion. Leslie, thank you as well for your contributions and, and insights. It's really been uh, a wonderful session. We've tackled some, uh, some difficult issues and done so, I think, in a way that has been uh, uh, open-minded, uh, learning-oriented, and uh, can spawn, if you if you like uh, further debates and discussions and, and, and do, uh, I'll put a plug in for Jonathan's book. It's a great read. You may not agree with everything, but I think it's, it's going to make you think. And I think that's what we try to do. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks. <laughs>